friend, Kent Broom. Come up here, Kent. He's gonna help me teach this class. You can bring up more and more plants. No, I love distillium. I just that's want great. to show him the break the pot. Okay, you okay. Can't do anything up here, so. Okay, that's good. Now make sure we talk only on the microphone. Kent Broom is uh, he is Bailey's nursery. He's one of the largest growers in the west half of the country, based out of Minnesota. But we love your 500. <laughs> really? Is that really Minnesota? You got him kidding me. <laughs> I'm from Colorado, but. Yeah. <laughs> I was begging Bailey to come to Prescott because their stuff is so nice, so unusual, and so right for the high altitudes of the Rockies. And I've tried for years, and they finally opened up a 500 acre farm in Portland, which is where we pull a lot of material conifers. From Spokane to Portland to Salem to that part of the country, they finally have a farm. And they finally said, "Yes, I'll come to Prescott if I have to." <laughs> so I Kent is their guy. Thirty years ago, but you know now I'm back. Yeah, that's so, good. I'm really so, glad to come down. He's going to help me teach a class. Just tell us about that bucket. That you well, got. I just first wanted, edition. First of all, I just we we have a couple brands. You guys never heard of Bailey's. We're a big name in the. We're about five thousand acres, so up in the Midwest and all and. We have a division, we do some sales in Europe and even in Asia. So um, we're good size, but we have a couple brands, first editions, and then some Easy Elegance Roses, and some Hydrangeas, which you all don't do much with, but if you want to get a first editions brand, they're very successful plants. We test them, we winter them in uh, Minnesota. This one we wouldn't, of course, but that's why we've got a place in Oregon. Um, only place you can get it in Arizona really is water plants. We sell some barrel liners in here for the big growers to grow up because we, we sell a lot to large growers. Um, but if you want to get that brand, and they're very good brand, tested, we've worked with them, we've selected them, here's where to get it. So look for that pot, and he's got some around here. Hopefully we'll have more coming in. Um, and we've got sure. a brand new plant coming out in 2018, which will be available this fall, all about doing a screen. So we'll talk about that just briefly later on, but yeah. it's, that's a great brand for us here. Okay, this is Distillium. Linebacker Distillium. Did I get that right? This that linebacker. Is so this is a huge evergreen that's low water use, grows very fast, and it doesn't have the disease issues that red tip potinia does. Red tip potinia, I pay my daughter's college tuition on that plant alone, just the diseases that it gets. Powdery mildew, deer eat on it, it just constantly has pressure on it because it's a high maintenance plant. But they're cheap. You get a lot of plant for the money. But they go in cheap, but then they're expensive to maintain, and they're short-lived. Distillium, you should come up with a better name than this, like uh, Big Green Beefy Planters, some hey, big boy. I don't know. I don't, uh, do, I don't do the names. So, so <laughs> Distillium, where does that come from? Anyway, okay, so anyway, that's, that's Kent. So where do we want to start? Because we didn't really talk about this. I was thinking just plant tour, which plants grow really well. Why don't you lead us off with maybe living screens? Well, I'll talk about that. living screens. I do some design work um, for a lot of people. Um, and I really got into living fences lately. I think living fences, you know, they're very European. They were huge 50 years ago, 60 years ago, 70 years ago, you know. And here we are, kind of, we're all going back, you know, to, and I, I, I call it European garden design. But anyway, uh, Ken's brought in some plants here. For the live stream folks, I'll just kind of bring this over so you can see him. Right over here, so we'll just like perspective like I'm this unlike, is front row seat. Though. Unlike Ken, you can look over me and see everything behind. <laughs> uh, so, but uh, they're they're getting huge, and for privacy screening around a patio, around you know a sitting place, a private space, you know every every garden should have a private space in it for you to go with a seat or something like that. They're phenomenal, and you can hedge them, you can make them formal, you can make them whatever you want to make. So, and then you can change them out all the time too if you want to, because they're, they're mostly vines, grow super, super quick. If you don't like what's in there for a couple of years, rip it out, put a new one in. Um, just be prepared maybe to enhance the fences and goats, because they're fantastic. My bad. So I'm trying to get the voice and the video. This live stream thing is actually difficult. So Ken's brought up a couple flowers here, and that's great. My bad. Honeysuckle's phenomenal, great for the bees. Cross vines, phenomenal, great for the bees. Um, silver lace is, a lot of people like silver lace. I think it kind of crashes after a little bit, but it's still a great plant. One thing I really want to point out here is the edibles he's brought up. Because you can grow grapes on a privacy fence, and they're phenomenal. And with, you know, typically edible grapes have been kind of a hard one to find in the West. In the last 10, 15 years, there have been some very good tasting, you know, table grapes that you can grow on a privacy fence. 
And so I looked at that too, and he's even got brambles back here, some uh, some raspberries, and blueberries, blackberries, not blueberries, but blackberries, just phenomenal for a fence. And again, you can hedge these guys out, just make it a perfect square wall. You know, I, I don't like formality that much, so I would rather let it kind of take off. Um, and I'd go that direction, just around a little patio setting, it changes the entire space that you're trying to put in. That's good. So I have actually used grapes up a, uh, I've actually used a grapevine, several of them, up a lattice work on my deck. And then it came up over the lattice this way and grapes would actually hang down. You can do that. And it looked really good. And I didn't have to treat it like a, I think sometimes we can take our edibles, because that's a big theme right now. Right. We've got so many great growers that they're coming out with better and better edibles. So grapes and blackberries for, uh, for my cedar fence, I have to have a fence for my dogs. So you've seen Bailey and Vincent roaming around, kind of free-ranging reading folks through the nursery every other day or so. Got to keep them in a fence. I don't like cedar fences. They're ugly. And so what I did is I took grapes and brambles and I just kind of, I, I softened up that fence line. And now the grapes and the brambles grow up the six-foot fence and then over so that it's beautiful. It feels more like a secret garden now and it's edible so the top half of the property i use for myself because i have more blackberries i know what to do with more raspberries more grapes i know what to do with and the bottom half because we're kind of bird we love birds and so we leave those for them and so then generally it works out they leave some of these for us and they eat the rest so it's kind of an attractor and it just looks good so I'm using barriers like physical fencing and I'm putting plants in to get the feeling that I want because I want to go in my backyard. We live in the public side, Lisa and I. We want to go home and feel alone. We don't want our neighbors peering out. In our front yard, people actually drive by and look us up, drive by just to see what the yard looks like. It's kind of intimidating. So we're, we're unlisted, but people have a way of finding you. And so you'll see this car coming up the hill, they slow down and couples are going, <laughs> and look at what's going on. It's pretty, but you can't enjoy. The backyard is private, very seclusive. Ponds are, are flowing, water is coming, birds are coming through. Birds are so thick that you know, walk through the yard like this, they don't hit you. So they're just oh, thick. That's a, little, that's a little extreme. There are a lot of birds. I mean, from I've seen bald eagles go across. Oh. They don't they don't camp out in our yard, but they use the ridge line to float from Watson Lake. We overlook the Dells out to wherever they're going, to kestrels, to all kind, every kind of bird you can think of, there's, there's a bunch. So we, we use that as a way to draw them in. So yes, question. How do you control the blackberries? How do I control the blackberries for the folks watching live? Because uh, in the Northwest, they're a weed. They are weed, but you're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. They don't grow as aggressively here, and they, they, they're easier to stay in control because it's so arid. And I'll notice the, the berries are a little bit smaller, and they're sweeter, especially grapes. They're a little smaller, and they're very sweet uh, than, than what I had, let's see, in California or other places that I've, I've had, had grapes. So I brought the uh, silver lace vine because if you want native, that's the hardiest of all the vines. It's, it's a weed, and truly, that's a, that's a noxious weed. It will grow up, take over, no care. You can take that cruise down to Panama for a month, come back, this thing is still thriving. And all, when, all summer long, it's got these beautiful white flowers that flow down over the vine. Very pretty. And when I grew it up my chain link fence in the Prescott Valley, uh, what I did is in the winter, I'd take my head shears, I'd just shear it as close as I could to the fence line on both sides, fertilize it with the all-purpose plant food, and it would come right back just like that. I did the same thing with my honeysuckle. So Japanese honeysuckle or, or Hall's honeysuckle. That's probably the number one kind of evergreen vine that we have. It's mostly ever, most years it's evergreen. It has a real pretty yellow flower that's real sweet tasting. You know, as a kid used to pull the stamen out and suck the nectar. It's that honeysuckle grows here. And it doesn't get rangy as easily as other parts of the country. It grows up fences very, very quickly. So for living screens, it's exceptional. What, Kent, why don't you pull out this cross vine that, the one that's blooming right there? You you and, and real quick, on, don't worry about the berries taking over. You know, we've got like, several thousand acres up in Oregon we farm on, and 
you know, the, as you've seen when you're driving around up there, the berry hedges are 12 feet tall and they're 12 feet wide. And, and when we leave, we've all got purple hands from picking the berries off of them. You know, they won't do that here. Ken's dead on right. They're going to be sweet. They're manageable. They're perfect. And the, we've got a new term called edible landscape, which I think is kind of, well, it's a good term, I guess. But all we're doing is stepping back 100 years. Yeah. When everyone yeah, planted true. everything to, to, to eat. And it's just where we should have kind of been anyway. Not to, not, ornamentals are great, and that's why it's mostly sell. But edible landscape is just a natural part of our heritage, about where we've come from and where we're probably going, so. You know what I find, too, is the younger generations, that millennials, we're all hearing about the millennials, oh, they're gonna resurrect this whole Victoria, Victory Garden, edible living, they love, they you do. see more families coming in, putting fruit trees, and we see that as the gateway drug to gardening. As you start doing edibles, and you just get hooked, you just you just it goes from there. And so you grow that first tomato, you pick it up fresh off the vine, and you're just hooked. You got to grow spinach, and then you got to grow berries, and you got to grow apples, and it just kind of grow, goes from there. So we love gateway drugs. Yeah, my kids Very tell me I was like 50 years. They said, Dad, you're like 50 years ahead of your time. When we were growing up, you know, we had berries, and we had peaches, we had a, I had a uh, Asian little Asian pear orchard in Utah, and all. I go, well, actually, it was a survivability. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> we are just trying to feed you kids. But uh, it's really coming back around. And so edible landscape, I guess, is a term. But it's just kind of common sense. And it's a way to get out and enjoy your area. So, this is yeah. a cross vine. I'm trying to get people to plant this more. It's a new vine. Uh, grows really well in the high, high desert. But it also does exceptionally well here. This vine is evergreen. It looks, the vine, the flowers actually look like a campsus or, or a, uh, um, what do they call it? Campsus trumpet erratica. Vine. Trumpet vine. Was, that's what I thought it was. Right? Yeah, it looks like it's a trumpet vine. Hummingbirds would love it. It's evergreen. But this vine will grow up a, up a trellis or, or some sort of climbing, and it will be this tight, no maintenance, just, just this far off the, the whatever it's climbing and solid. So it doesn't get this mass did this way where it weights down so heavy the fence and it falls over it keeps very very tight and very thick on that vine so it's an evergreen there's not many vines that are evergreen most of them are deciduous they'll lose their leaves this one i'm selling more and more of my started started two years ago and we'll get the word out and eventually it'll take off we'll have more specimens until the specimen counts on in the neighborhoods get picking up really we sell more plants by someone drives by and goes "Ooh, what is that than, than trying to talk them into a new plant. But this is a cross vine. I think it's it's a good one for tight spaces that that uh, where properties are so tight. Now we get that fence line is like six feet from your house. It's good to soften that up. So when you're walking down that pathway, you get some privacy at the kitchen or at the, those areas. So cross vine. Thank you, Kat. What's that called again? Cross cross vine. Yeah. Yes. So, her question is, if she's got a three-foot fence, or four-foot, whatever the standard thing is, hip-high, and you want, it to be, you want it to be private up to head-high, up here, uh, what do you do? There it's going to be, you need a trellis for vines, you need something for them to crawl up. They won't just naturally go like this, free-form. Vines won't. Brambles will. They'll, they'll grow up, they'll get these long canes that kind of flow up, especially things like... Uh, I love the black satin, thornless, moisenberries, thornless blackberries. They're quite good at that. Big canes are kind of flow up. So you could use that, or you use shrubbery. Or we'll get into some other stuff that's more upright evergreens. Really, some trouble, well, okay. Then, then you have to use shrubbery. So there's always shrubbery. Shrubbery. Yeah, that's Monty Python. I'm selling shrubbery. Yeah, anyway, we, we, we digress. Maybe we should go over maybe the shrubs, and then we'll go to the big trees. How about that? All right, great. So okay. you, where are you comfortable going? I'll well, um, I will do, I don't care. Show uh, the ones you like. Show off your... your well, I brought up real show quick. Your, I snuck up a barberry. Okay. There's a lot of new Rocket Series barberries out there that get about five feet tall. So, you know, for a sitting area, it's great. But if you have grandkids, and you want a little privacy from them a little bit, or you have, they don't like to come through this stuff. It's got thorns. Yeah. So, so barberries have to You know, if you have a little sitting area, and if you're only like a little over five foot tall, this is great as a privacy screen. And, you know, privacy doesn't always mean visual. It also just means 
keeping people out. Yeah. And so, you know, a little gate or something like this, a screen like this, there's a lot of little bunnies that don't even like to go through this. So if you have a lot of rabbits and stuff, if you want to just screen off a little bit of a deck or a little bit of a patio, these are great. They come in red, green, yellow, you yeah, name it. Yeah, yeah, just fantastic. Really good plant for here. Really hardy, very yep. tough. Yep. Once they're rooted, they're really tough. Yeah, barberries were huge 30 years ago. They took it. Everything dip. comes back around. Yeah, and now they're back around with, <laughs> with new flavors, shapes, sizes, the whole bit. So um, that's why I hold that guy up. Just I so. use this one quite often when I'm designing for security underneath your, your windows yep, yep. and stuff plant them there because you're not going to mess with this. Uh, you, you wouldn't physically want to be behind this to figure out how to break into your windows. This is this is going to keep you Yeah, tough so guys are really tough until they are got to wiggle through those. Then I'll say, hey, anyway. Yeah, so. plus we'll have DNA samples at that point because they'll be bleeding <laughs> out as they go through the window. We'll find them, I guarantee. So, Rocket Barberry, that's good. Yeah, Talk that's about great. your... Uh, I don't know. Bamboo. Well, bamboo's uh, great. Anonymous. Uh, you know, all of these he's got, Ken's put some samples up here. We didn't even talk about this before, so we're just kind of winging it. I love Euonymus. You can box it. You can shape it. You know, there's a book called The Founding Gardeners, and Andrea Wolf wrote it, and it's about the founding fathers of the country and their gardens, and they were all avid gardeners. George Washington writes about his favorite thing was to go back and work on his hedges and screens. That's how he relaxed in between. And when he was gone for, I think, five or six years during the war and everything, he kept writing about, I want to get back home so I can relax in my garden and work on my hedges and screens. So, and some of them were manicured, so they'd take something like this and box it up. I think uh, Jefferson, I think Jefferson was a, uh, was a wild guy. He let it just take off. You know, and he talks about just letting him go. And so you can you can box this, make it a perfect square, ball, whatever you want to do, or you can just make it grow natural. Either way, fantastic. Evergreen all year long, fantastic yep. plant. Yeah, good plant. And again, good about six, seven, eight, you know, about this height, head high, thick shrub, but you get that kind of variegation. Yeah, which beautiful. This, this is its winter color. It has not pushed any growth. This, this is how it looks in midwinter. Just starting to push new leaves. And the new new leaves will be a little bit brighter gold, and as it enlarges, gets mature, then it fades and mutes a little bit. So good for variegation. You either love yellow or you don't. But I also have it in cream color. I also have it in green. You want E O U Y M Y O U S. Something like that. It comes in a couple of different flavors. Yeah. It, Ken's got probably green and whatever else. So. I've got probably a dozen varieties of this. Yeah. So do the deer like Euonymus, they do. Yeah, you know, it's hard yes. to put in a salad bar and not have a few guests show up. <laughs> so that's kind of part of the deal. You put in a salad bar, you're gonna have people show up, so. Show us the Ketonia, so there's a party eye. Get that, that one right there, and the silver bird. Bring both of those. Right here, I got right here. Deer don't eat this one, and they don't eat that yellow one. Good. This is the native. Oops, is that me or you? This is a native. You want draw hardy. And that same gold kind of leaf, they do do not eat this. This is called silverberry, Eliagnus, is the, the botanical name. Uh, this plant is very drought hardy. This is its winter color again, but it's got a silver backing on the leaf, which makes it super efficient on its water use. So if you're gonna kill this, it'll be from overwatering. It likes to be abused, it likes to go on neglect, it likes that. And so it's a true, true native, and the animals don't eat it. I would rather see you all plant this for bigger hedges than red tip botinia. Just because it's so much less maintenance, less water, less use, doesn't have any disease I know of, and it's got a real fragrant, small flower, an insignificant flower, but super sweet. I can always tell where Eliagnus is growing in the wild by the fragrance in spring. So it's very, very fragrant that way. Silver berry. Silver berry. It doesn't actually get berries. I don't know why I call it silver berry. So that's gilded edge silver berry. Well, a lot of the maturity or the yellow agnes tree form and all are silver. They call them berries or silver oh. berry, or red berries. So, you know, that's not a tree form, of course, but it could be just for that. So yeah. Whatever. Mine, I use this in my own house um, just because I wanted low maintenance. Low. I don't hardly ever hedge it. I let it go wild. It's been in for three or four years. It's now, it's now this high. So you can easily, you can hedge it, make it thick. You can actually trim it and make it a boxed edge. You could do that if you wanted. My yard, I like it more wild. I notice the birds like it too. They like to kind of wrestle, get in there as well. And if you come into waters and buy plants that the deer don't feed on, 
you're all of a sudden going to find out that you enjoy the deer more because even if they're feeding, you know, they don't destroy your landscape. The fact that they nibble on plants here and there, we, we kind of want because most of us are, you know, we love nature, we want to be out there. So if you come into Waters Garden, you ask them, I need some stuff that deer don't eat, and, and can guide you that direction, you're going to find out that the, when they do eat something, you're not as stressed about it. It's not that big of a deal. So. They don't eat as nearly as much. No. Deer have a stomach system, kind of like cattle. They'll nibble something, they'll eat half a branch before they realize, oh yeah, I don't like that. Before they graze, they kind of graze through, and, but at least they won't nibble it to the ground. At least it's not luscious. Oh, this is the best thing ever. Hey Joe, let's go over to their house. Bring the chips and salsa. Party's it. We're eating there, you want us. This is uh, another, not native, but super draw party. Um, this one I used out the farm to hide a 500 gallon propane tank. This looks like a submarine. This is a huge propane tank. And it was right at my back door before it went to the greenhouses. It's huge in the greenhouses. Ugly as could be. I planted three of them, two in front and one on the side. And within a year, it had grown up and hidden this humongous white tank. This is a cotton easter or cotone aster. That's how you actually pronounce it. Red clusterberry cotone aster. It gets easily, easily this tall. It uh, gets white flowers in the spring. This is its winter look. It has not pushed any foliage yet, but it will first bloom, and then it will put little clusters of red berries, thus the name, red clusterberry cotone aster. Very good. Man, deer do not eat it, and it does not get mildew, doesn't get any real issues. It's a great plant for you. Pretty as can be. Fantastic. Yeah. So that's big shrubs. Any other big, maybe bamboo? Well, and bamboo. I was going to mention privet, privet real quick because yeah. uh, privet is a piece of cake to take care of. Yeah, super I don't easy. don't have any problems with it or anything. Yeah. Uh, comes in different flavors. And one thing I want to talk to you about real quick is this fall, we've got a plant, new plant coming out for 2018. It's available to our, our independent garden centers. So that would be can this fall. And it's a privet. Um, I actually introduced it to Bailey's. A friend of mine had it. It's been in the, it's, about a 50 year old plant is called straight talk privet yep. that would be a first edition plant it gets about 15 feet tall and about three feet around and it'll stay evergreen here to almost christmas and then it drops real quick and then it comes pops back out but no you can never put a shear to it and it's going to be about two and a half feet wide and about 12 15 feet tall for a for a privacy screen that's about as good as you can get and it's that dark green just fantastic we'll look for it Next year, yep, maybe next this spring. fall, or yep. we'll have it. So I love going off to the, to the trials. We get to actually, at least I get the inside tour sometimes. As we see what's coming down the pipeline, it's really exciting. It's Cribbits like are great. Yeah, privets. Uh, this one grows up about is that six or eight? Six to eight yeah. feet, so like, about like this big. Yeah. So like red tip botinia. Okay. Well, my, the new growth, you see this just starting to flush. This is last, this is the winter color. You see the new growth, that Kelly Green, that's the new growth coming out right now. And you can see a little bit of flower bud coming on this guy too. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. a little bit of flower to it. Fast. fast grower. Yeah, say so a year easily. They maybe move more. Along. Yeah, maybe more. It'll do fine in the wind. Yep, yeah, does good in the winds. Evergreen. You know, it's privets, a tough plant. Yeah, privets are uh, the one we're introducing, and a lot of them are zone two. So, I mean, they can take everything you're going to throw at them. I mean, yeah. they're really, privets really, when it comes down to it, are kind of a weed. So. But, the reason they're so tough in the arid climate is their their leaves are all waxy, yeah. thus the wax leaf privet, and so it encases the moisture in wax so it doesn't perspire as much as let's say some other thinner, uh, less hardy plants. Wax leaf privet. Maybe we should go over. How are we doing on time? Because we do not want to go over. I told them I would not go over an hour. We're at 15 more minutes. Yeah. Good. I'm trying to keep on track. There's so much going on today. I can't keep up. Some of your big shrubs. Maybe we can do it this way. I'll kick these this way. And then I should also cover, how much time do we have? I'm not gonna get everything, there's way too much information to get out. So let's go over this guy. This is Arizona Cypress, which is trying to get where the folks watching Facebook can, can see it. Arizona Cypress. Many of the junipers that we see, they aren't junipers, they're, they're cypress. Especially as you go down towards Skull Valley, Baghdad, Kirkland, that's where Arizona cypress is famous. It's a local plant. It grows right here. Once you get established, you go on its own. It grows up to about 25 feet tall by about 12 feet wide. In short order. It looks thin right now. Chris with Savannah, I was used up here just a minute ago, he grows these for me. 
beautiful, thick, lush. It will be solid 20 by 10, just, just solid. You cannot see through it. We use this a lot in the bigger properties. Chino Valley, where wind is serious. Up on the ridge lines, where it's hard to get things to take. This is one that we'll use to cut the wind and then create this screening border going down the property line. I would not put this right next to my house. Your house will be obliterated. It will, be, it will disappear behind this huge blue juniper looking plant. So this one does not put on a berry like a juniper, it now puts on a little tiny cone. And it doesn't have the allergy issues that junipers do. So it's a better one. If you need something big, you want it to go fast, Arizona Cypress. We should cover how to space. So if you've got a property line, how many plants do I need? That's always a question, we're always helping. Here's the secret. If you know this plant grows 12 feet wide, just look, look at the tag, it says width, grows privet, 10 by six. If you want this to be a solid wall of nothing but privets, you want to be a solid wall of nothing but Arizona cypress, whatever plant you're looking at, look at the width, divide it by two, that's your planting width, that's it. That's real simple, right? So if it's 12 foot wide and you want it to be solid, the headlights to the cars are coming down at night, going into your bedroom, and I want it to be a solid, living, green thing. The neighbors are on the back patio, and they're driving me crazy because they're always out there with a the fire pit going, and they're looking right into my living room. It bugs me. This is how you do it. 12 foot wide, so you divide it, go about six, eight foot width, and within short order, you will have this overlapping pattern that is solid up the entire height of that plant. Did I explain that right? Does it make sense? So just take the width of the plant, divide it by two, and that's your planting space. Now, you don't have to go that deep. You don't have to go overlapping. Maybe I want some space in between. So you can do that too. You can have it more natural and less formal, solid wall of green up to this high. So you can, you can, you can mix and match. What I have done several times on my properties is I'll take something like this Arizona Cypress, but it grows a little slower, and I'll plant things like this Aspen in between, which is a tremendously fast grower. So I'll blend the two together, and I kind of come up with this more garden feel. Instead of a wall, now I've got a planting border, a foresty, natural, it looks more natural that way. We have very in formal landscape styles here. East Coast is very formal. They'll take boxwoods and they line them out and do squares and they make sculptures and that's, that's, that's formal gardens. I know there's my nurses, engineers, accountants, they love formal because it's very orderly. It's right, we got this. But sometimes there are natural boulders and they, our landscapes are generally more informal kind of landscape. Well, that kind of blends the two together. So I get the height, very instantaneous height with my deciduous trees while I wait for my evergreens to grow up because their evergreens are slower growing. That's just the way it is. So an idea for you, okay? Yeah, and I've got a real quick addition, and Ken will love me for this. Always buy extra plants. Oh, because, you. <laughs> you know, and I used to do a lot of design work, and I used to host the garden tour. My house was the kickoff tour for Utah here. Yes. And so uh, what people never could quite grasp is you know, I always looked at a plant or a hedge, you know, Ken said put them like on this guy, like six or eight foot on center. You know, it's a lot better to rip some few plants out in 15 years from now than to wait 15 years for, oh, it finally filled in. You know, we can go out on our deck right now. You know, it's a lot better to have an arborist or, or yourself go out and rip a few out in 10 years and have that solid fence right off the bat or in a year or two than to just be patiently waiting, patiently waiting. I, it, it was always a hard thing. When we'd go out and do a landscape design for somebody, they'd always say, well, I want it to look just like that. And you go, well, but your spacing's too tight. Well, you know, you've got to get in there and work your landscape in a few years from now. So listen to a spacing. I'd even get tighter. Because I don't want it done. I, know. I don't want to think of the being sold or something. <laughs> but, no. but, you know, it Pressure. literally is a matter of time. You know, how long do I want to wait for this to be accomplished? And so get after it. It's a lot better to go in and deal with it 10 years later and say, well, let's pop this guy out every other one, you know, and keep this thing moving along. That's a good point. I have, if money is no option, no object, that's, that's great. You bet. Yeah. If they're just, it's a new homeowner, they just started out, they've got nothing, they made the resource a little tight, there I've actually helped folks. I'll take a big specimen and I'll place it 
right there where the where the problem is, right where the neighbors, you know, they're look neighbors looking right down at your hot tub. We'll put a big one right there, so we have instant. And we'll put smaller specimens on either side. That's another way to maybe stretch the dollars, but have instantaneous uh, privacy right now. We'll just take a great big Colorado spruce. We'll put most of our landscape dollars in that because that's a, that's an expensive tree. Then we'll put smaller ones down here so we'll wait for them to grow up. So another good good choice. Maybe we should cover junipers. Yeah, junipers are great, tough as nails. We're surrounded by juniper forests. Yeah. So um, Hollywood junipers for you folks in the, from Southern California. That's one that kind of grows like this, okay? But it grows to 18 feet, 15 feet tall by about that wide. So it's another good juniper for here. Um, this one is, let me just go over there, great, great lean. Maybe you point them out. Maybe show me the, show me the herbivita. Make sure the folks watching live, they can, they can kind of see it too. So this is arborvita. This is an old school plant. Um, arborvita does really well here. And so it's just nice green, just green, thick. And so this is called Emerald Isle. It gets up about eight to 10 feet by about three feet wide. If you've got a real tight space, let's say the fence is right there. You want to grow past the fence. You can put this down that fence line and it will grow up thick, solid. Um, but your space, if it only gets three feet wide, you want it to be a solid row of green? That's every foot or two. That's just right here, like right on each other. Okay? Uh, I want to call the gold, gold juniper, uh, I think that's a gold juniper or cypress. That one? Cypress or cedar? Cypress. This is a sometimes green and blue. We, we grow, blue is famous here. And sometimes we get too much blue. If you get all that uh, oak out there, you just put more blue and it looks kind of more blue. It just disappears. Sometimes you want a contrasting color. Let's say you've got these big islands of, of native, manzanitas, uh, oaks, that kind of stuff. You want something to be private right here, but you want it to be more garden-esque. Sometimes you can use gold as a contrasting. It looks really good in native landscapes. and dresses it up like immediately. This guy, this guy grows 15 feet tall by three feet wide to the moon by this big round. Kind of like a gold Italian cypress is what it is. But it's got that gold color. That's its actual color. You either love that or you hate it. I find that you don't want to put this in a yard that's surrounded by crushed granite. If you put it in amongst a bunch of all, all this other gold, it's like having a house full of beige and you want more beige, 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 beige. Sometimes you get more gold, 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 gold. It just looks like gold. It's going to have contrast. If you had crushed granite everywhere, it's gold. I'd put blue in because those are complementary colors. If you got a whole bunch of blue foliage, I'd put gold in because now all of a sudden it looks sexy and new and designer esque. And I think it'll even get more gold. I, I mean, do too. With, with age. Growth will come out a lot more. So. Yeah. Again, this is its winter color. The new growth is bright. I mean, just really, really bright. Okay, done with that. And Juniper, we could go on and on. Anyway, we'll be here to help show off stuff. Um, we should go over, oh, we should do this one right here, because this is the uh, Arizona Christmas tree. The, uh, on the courthouse, they've got the one, the biggest tree, it was planted in 1914. Oops, made you, made you flinch. <laughs> Didn't see that one coming, thank you. Uh, the biggest tree, the statehood tree, that's this tree. This is a, a um, blue atlas cedar. Big trunk, it looks innocent. This is a big, fast growing evergreen. Big swooping branches. The negative is, it doesn't like to get full in a bucket. It likes to be in the ground. And as soon as it's in the ground, this thing will quadruple, and more than quadruple the width. Great big long branches. But take a look, downtown, uh, the front, right in front of the courthouse, from Gurley, the biggest tree, that's, that's, that's this guy right here. On the back side, interestingly enough, now we're into trivia, just because I noticed plant trivia. The back side, you know what the biggest evergreen is? The biggest tree on the entire courthouse complex. The biggest tree bar none. Redwood. Take a look. It's on the back lawn, closest to the Chamber of Commerce and uh, the post office back there. There's a tree that towers about 50 feet above the elms. You only see this when you're on the downtown, upstairs, downtown buildings. You look out over the trees and this redwood is towering above all the other trees. That's a redwood. So it's 
to this. Probably, they're probably both from 1914 or whatever. We became a state. You saw redwoods. We do have redwoods. Yeah, they, they're amazing. It was, it was desert southwest. Redwoods just. Anyway. You wouldn't think it would do well, but no, it does. No. Yeah. And they'll, they'll probably grow up three, four feet yearly in their feet in the ground. Yeah. Fantastic. And then uh, here's how to get them to. to, to uh, I'll tell you, show you real quick. Oops, my bad. It's, well, it's laying flat or something. Yeah, That's what the problem is. Hold that thing, will you? Then add add to this. Let's see. Let me let me pick a let me pick a plant. Push this back. Now pick one that we haven't talked about. Maybe this one. Oh no, that's heavy. Let me get this one. Yeah, this one's better. I can lift this one. It's a Spartan juniper. What is it? Wichita Wichita blue juniper. It's not to talk about the plant, but how do you plant it so it grows fast? And why don't we move that cypress so the screen can see there. So the way you plant things here, plant roots do not go down at all. There's nothing down there for them to go to except clay, rocks, caliche. There's no, there's no water. There's no food. There's nothing for roots to go down. That's a myth. That's what... That's what the people in the Midwest do when they have eight foot loamy soil. Yes, roots will go down there. They don't go down here. They go sideways. Only about 18 inches in the ground. They don't go down, they go straight out. Because that's where the food is. That's where the, that's where the mycorrhizal fungi, that's where the compost, that's where, the, that's where things are. Uh, they go out. And that's also where the rain is. The way our rains work, it's feast or famine. So if you're going to get a monsoon, you're going to be dry from April and May through June until the monsoons come in July, August, and September. You're going to put roots out like this so that when it does rain, you can absorb as much as you can as possible in as short order as you can. That's how plants are designed to work in the Southwest. If you know that's how the roots are going to grow anyway, let's encourage them to grow out. And so the, the, the planting hole, you only go as deep as the bucket that you bought. Don't go down to China. Just go only as deep as the bucket. You do not have to go any farther. Very easy to dig a wide hole. Very difficult to dig a deep hole. Don't go deep. Go shallow, but go wide. Then we're going to add a bucket on either side. Round and saucer shaped. That's how you dig your hole. So you just dig that out. You got a pile of dirt there. Screen the dirt. Some of you don't have dirt. You've got rocks. And you'll find debris, your contractor buried stuff in the yard, all kinds of crazy stuff, old roofs. Screen all that out. None of it's good. Anything bigger than a golf ball, get rid of it. Okay, because it's going to heat up in summer. It doesn't, it can't hold any water molecules. There's no redeeming, nothing redeeming about anything bigger than a golf ball. Screen that out. You're going to have, some of you are going to have soil left, some of you are going to have to supplement. Now we want to add some organic matter. There is nothing in your soil right now. The contractor took the backhoe and scraped every bit of topsoil you had, scraped it off to the side. Some of you are literally, you're literally, you're growing in dead soil. There's nothing living there. You won't find one worm, not one living thing is in your soil. The way you encourage living stuff back into your soil, is you've got to get that organic. You gotta create, you gotta bring the topsoil back. Until you've got topsoil, the plants will not grow. So you've got to add some organic. You can't put topsoil over the entire yard. It's too expensive. But we can do it by planting whole. So there we want to add water's premium mulch that Patty talked about. This is coming out of the White Mountains, out of sawmills and stuff. This is compost. This is, this is uh, um, composted mulch. It looks rich and chocolatey. You add about 25% of this to your native soil. That's going to do two things. One, it encourages the living stuff in the soil to start, come, you'll find worms are automatically attracted to that because they'll start breaking down all that organic material. Um, it holds moisture because organic material holds moisture around the roots. It also keeps all that clay from compacting right back down into a solid form so the roots can get through the soil faster. It's all about roots. You've got to get roots into the surrounding soil in a dry climate. The faster you can do that, the faster the plant will grow. We're going to take that, blend that mulch and that dirt, backfill around that dirt ball, around that root ball, pack it down, water it in. Um, and after that, I'll take some all-purpose plant food. 
is the fertilizer we put together. Um, years and years ago, we sell mountains of this stuff, literally. Um, you want to sprinkle the recommended amount around the root ball, and this is going to, what's going to break down over the next three, four months, this is what's going to encourage new growth, new roots, new foliage, faster growth. So each time you water or it rains, it's going to release a little bit of food back to that plant over the next several months. After that, when it's all done, I water it in with root and grow. This is a rooting hormone. So you're going to break some roots. This is like open heart surgery and brain surgery at the same time. When you pull a plant out of a bucket, put it in your ground, that is really hard on a plant. It's never known anything but this. Now, it's putting, you're putting your yard in Arizona. That's hard. So you're going to break some roots. This helps the transplant shock. And it helps the root hairs that when you, when you sever a few root hairs, you give, you give it some of this, it'll start forming two, three root hairs out of that break. It'll start forming, going into that surrounding soil. So you always need three things whenever you plant. Mulch, food, and root to grow. And that's how you plant. And that will also be in that book that I'll send you here shortly. Okay? It's got the exact same pictures, the whole thing. Questions on how to plant. That's how you're going to get them to grow fast. Got it? Now, at 11.30, dang, that thing was just watered. <laughs> so it's heavy. Um, so we're going to hang out here, answer questions. Pick this guy's brain. He's actually really crazy smart. He knows plants. I'll be hanging out too. Uh, and then in, in an hour, at 11.30 sharp, we're going to come down and we're going to, if you want to win some plants, it'll be fun, nothing else. Uh, and it's a high, high likelihood you'll win something because we have a bunch of prizes. So, and it's just fun to watch a machine power up and watch a tree. Literally, he's got trees going through this grinder. My guess is, my personal guess, because I've seen him chew up this cottonwood, although that looks like pine, my personal guess is it'll take five, six minutes. I, don't, I literally have no idea. But don't guess 30 minutes, because that would be way too long. So this is a grinder that's going to chew up in about maybe a minute and a half. I don't know. Somewhere in that under 10 minute form. Guess, guess in that range. Okay. Yeah. What's the name of the big blooming trees along the Oh, here? very yeah, good. White. You asked that before, the name it's of the blooming white. trees. There's two of them. So you've got a, a white one that you talked about. That's Bradford pear or f ornamental flowering pear. It's in bloom all around town right now. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a tree up to about 35 feet tall, perfectly round, all white. And then when it's done blooming, it'll form on a, a leaf, right? Just real dark green thick shade kind of tree it's also interestingly enough the last tree to turn red in fall so about thanksgiving it's the last tree in the progression of fall color to turn bright red that's the only color it comes up into i also have two three four types of flowering pears you've got bradford is the round one chanticleer is about this this round it's taller and narrower and aristocrats more of a street tree and then we've got jack pear that's tiny. It only gets head high. Perfect little tree. All have the same traits. White flowers, dark green foliage, red, red leaves like in the fall. Pears? They will not produce pears. No. They will not. Just purely for pretty. Now, there are some actual pears that you can plant, but they bloom later in the season. It's usually about another month for the, the pears. The one that's pink, there's a tree blooming pink all around town right now. That's Purple leaf plum. It blooms pink right now. It gets up about 12 feet tall, vase shaped, and then right after it's done blooming, it'll put on, put on this purple, like royal purple foliage. That's purple leaf plum. Although I did notice today that the uh, crab apples are starting. There's a, there's a tree that's coming out right now, kind of open today. It's got an even brighter pink. It puts the purple leaf plum to shame. It's, I mean, purple is ugly compared to crab apples because it's a fuchsia color. I mean, it's unbelievably bright. And again, it does not form real crab apples, not like your grandparents grew. It can, can have little tiny fruits that I find the robins eat. They love. My, my robin yeah. in winter will eat all the... Ken, real quick, crab, crab apples got a really bad name 50 years ago because of the fruit or was messy. The fruit's now almost all persistent. Yeah. So it sticks on all the way through spring. So the birds just kind of wipe it out. Yeah. So if you have a misconception about crab apples, I'll bet you money Ken doesn't have a crab apple here that's going to be a mess for you. Not at all. Yeah, they're going to be cleaned right up. 
because I get them from Bailey's Nursery. <laughs> so that's pretty much, we are looking for clean, neat, tidy, low maintenance, low water. Those are the trends right now. We want to have our rock, rock lawn, and I don't want things to drop, and or I do, or I want it to blow away in the neighbor's yard, and I don't want it to break. That's that's a crap. Okay, with that, give uh, Kent's room a big hand. Thank you for being here.